Welcome to Brainfluence. I'm Roger Dooley. Joining me today is Tim Ash. You may know him as the author of Landing Page Optimization, perhaps the most thorough and authoritative guide to conversion optimization, or as the organizer of the Conversion Conference Series and other digital marketing events, or as the co-founder of conversion optimization firm, SiteTuners. But today we've got Tim Ash 2.0 here to discuss the ideas in his new book, Unleash Your Primal Brain, Demystifying How We Think and Why We Act. Tim, welcome to the show. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Roger. Glad to be here. Uh, yeah, and I, I remember when you were keynoting our conference uh, not, not that long ago. So it's, it's great to have known you over the years in the industry. Well, yeah, and actually, I have to give you credit for part of my own evolution. It's maybe sort of a play on the theme of the book here, but, uh, <laughs> uh, and that is because uh, when I was at that conference, one of my fellow keynoters was none other than, none other than B.J. Fogg, who was yes. there in his uh, purple uh, magician's robe. Uh, and uh, that was my first exposure, at least firsthand, to his thinking and his Fogg behavior model. And that really influenced my development going forward because I really saw uh, how that explained, uh, to me at least, so much about uh, how behavior change worked and uh, ultimately became the basis in part for my persuasion slide framework and uh, really uh, led to my current book, Friction, because that to me was the most <laughs> important uh, uh, element in persuasion slide. And in fact, if you talk to BJ Fogg, uh, he will say, don't focus on motivating people to do stuff, focus on making it easier, increasing ability, as he would say, but uh, so, yeah, or, or so the anyway, trigger. So his, yeah, yeah, his model was, is, is uh, says for an action to occur, you need three things to happen at the same time. You need the motivation, the ability, and a trigger. And all those have to come together for the action to take place. And it's brilliant in its simplicity. I mean, I think, and it applies to so many things if you're a marketer. Yeah, yeah. And uh, in motivation tends to be expensive. You know, I guarantee you'll get more orders on your site if you normally charge for shipping and give away shipping for free. Uh, or if you give people a 25% off coupon on their order, you'll sell more. But there is a price associated with that or a cost associated with that. So yeah, his, his thinking is really powerful. And that's um, part of that is why I ended up creating my friction book. Because uh, to me, it, I found as I researched it, I was initially thinking mainly of the effect on sales and customer experience. But as I dug into it, as perhaps it happened to you with your new Primal Brain book, uh, the more you dig into something, uh, sort of it expands into new territory and- Yep, uh, down the so, rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So anyway, uh, yeah, Tim, in my little intro, I talked about uh, what you've been doing. Why don't you bring us up to speed on what you're doing these days? Sure. Well, as you mentioned, I've been had it was the CEO and founder of Site Tuners and the Conversion Conference, which is an international conference series on improving website effectiveness. Now it's called Digital Growth Unleashed and it's still going on in Europe and the U.S. Uh, but I actually stepped out of an active role at Site Tuners and the agency, and I really want to focus on the um, evangelism and keynote speaking. I've been doing that, as you know, from <laughs> the badges behind me for a while now. So. It's, focusing on international keynote speaking right before the pandemic curtain came down. So I had events in Russia, Italy, Brazil, Argentina canceled just in the last few months alone. But it did give me the opportunity to write the book, which is my other passion project. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's, it's really a fascinating book. It's uh, based largely uh, in, on evolutionary psychology. And I'm a believer in evolutionary psychology, uh, not because there's so much um, in the way of uh, evidence or, uh, you know, statistical evidence behind it, but because it explains so much so effectively. Uh, and I'm curious, uh, what's your take on evolutionary psychology? I mean, obviously you buy into it. Uh, are, do the critics of it have any valid points? Um, you know, I don't know. I, I don't want to get into these kind of nuanced arguments about the critics criticizing stuff. Um, but to me, I'm sorry, but it's just like, it's freaking obvious right. in the sense that <laughs> the brain didn't just appear wholesale, the human brain and start to work and uh, it evolved. And early life on earth, we share things with the most primitive forms of life at the chemical level, um, then reptiles, mammals, apes, and then our bizarre, unique 
recent evolution. So you kind of have to trace that whole evolutionary arc to understand where we picked up a lot of our behaviors and a lot of the ways that we think. And, and that's the prism through which you need to view it. The brain evolved to help us survive, and here's the pressures under which it evolved, and here's where we ended up. So to me, without that, you can't understand you know, the business of persuasion and marketing. You can't understand leadership, personal relationships, communication, storytelling, um, personal development. I mean, all of it is based on evolutionary psychology. It's, so I, so the, I don't know how you would invalidate that. You know, we are the product of the path we took to get here. Yeah, and to me, it reminds me a little bit, we were talking about B.J. Fogg. You know, when he came out with his Fogg behavior model, he did not have a massive experimental evidence to back that up. Uh, you know, the way most psychology papers are, well, yeah, we did, you know, 100 subjects on this and 200 subjects on that. And over a course of three years, uh, we finally came up with this framework. Uh, but uh, it as you say, is in one sense obvious. Uh, in other words, once you see it, you say, well, this makes total sense. And then also, I think, um, you know, firms like yours uh, have proven those, uh, the facts in there to be uh, true time and time again. I mean, oh, yeah, you know, I mean, I, yeah, you know, BJ didn't have to run a bunch of experiments because every conver uh, conversion optimizer on the planet was basically demonstrating that his stuff was true. <laughs> That's right, exactly right. Uh, at Site Tuners, we created um, uh, 1.2 billion in documented value for you know, our clients from the Nestle's and Google's of the world on down. So I know it works, probably most of that value was using these evergreen tactics or strategies rather. So if you're a marketer and you don't understand how the brain works and what you're trying to influence, the tactics don't really matter. It's not about green button, orange button, split testing. It's about what's the motivation and what does our brain care about in terms of survival. Uh, so I know it works because, you know, so we made our clients a lot of money and continue to at Sight Tuners. Um, but I wanted to kind of get the word out more broadly. My problem is that you have, like you say, behavioral economists, you have neuroimaging guys, you have habit change people, public policy understanding, you know, kind of um, mindfulness and personal development. And all these people are like the proverbial blind men feeling different parts of the elephant. And I just want to shine a big spotlight and say, here's the elephant. Here's how we got here. And so it's not really these desperate, disparate rather tactics that we should be using. It's understanding the broader why behind evolutionary psychology. Right. And, uh, you know, less people think that this is a really inaccessible tome that uh, <laughs> explains human behavior. I uh, uh, can say that it is not. It's a very readable book. It's not uh, uh, extremely long. I think the time estimate was 174 minutes or something to uh, read it on the back cover. Yeah, yeah, you can you can see how thick it is. I mean, it's a six by nine book and it's not super thick or anything like that. I really cut out all the fluff and I did it in a very readable style because I I knew I was going to make the audio book, which I've recorded and narrated myself, and there are going to be translations, so there's no graphs, no footnotes. I'm not citing the same old studies that everybody cites and rehashes. This is a kind of a really fast-paced um, journey through, through evolution and told with some exciting anecdotes as well. Yeah, and uh, it's really sort of a basic guide to the operating system of, you know, I, I think if you look at what you're talking about, uh, uh, from the brain standpoint, you get people coming at it from different angles, uh, but mm -hmm. this is sort of, uh, okay, uh, here is the basic operating system, uh, and now, you know, use it from that what you need. If you want to talk about habits, uh, here are parts, if you want to talk about learning, here are other parts, and so on. Yeah, yeah, uh, so exactly it, right, yeah. I, I mean, I look at it as having three broad audiences. There's the business audience, so everything from leadership to marketing, sales, persuasion, all of all that world. Then there's personal relationships if you want to understand organizations and cultures and tribes and gender differences and uh, what motivates us. And then there's personal development. Um, you know, if you want to understand how to have a good life, you really need to understand how, how the brain really works instead of assuming that oh, we're just logical little robots all trying to optimize our own um, you know, existence here. That's not... <laughs> that's not reality. Right. Unfortunately, there's still a lot of decision making that seems to be based on that approach, uh, as opposed to how our brains really work. Uh, 
So how did, how did the book evolve? Did you start off focused on one area and did it expand? I, I kind of gave you the origin story for friction. I, did, uh, did this expand as you went or did you actually start off with this vision in place and just sort of fill in the blanks? Yeah, well, you know what this is? This is a, a story that's 35 years or so in the making. When I was in, at University of California, San Diego, I was there for undergrad and graduate school. My work was in cognitive science and computer engineering, put those together. Um, um, my graduate work was in neural networks or how to teach computers by example uh, instead of programming them, so what you'd now call AI or machine learning. And um, so I, I did, I studied the brain, always interested in it, and then applied it to marketing and running my own uh, digital agencies. Now kind of come full circle where I really want everyone to understand this, not just for a few clients to benefit financially from, from understanding how the brain works. So um, I guess you'd say it, it, it kind of needed to have given birth to, that was a weird construction, but uh, I hope you understand <laughs> it, it needed to get out. It needed to get born. And I just want to be kind of like Carl Sagan of the brain. You know, the, there's that Cosmo series uh, back in the day and you would say billions and billions of stars. And Carl Sagan <laughs> was kind of like the guy that made astrophysics popular. If you can make that fun, I figure I can make the human brain fun too. Right. And you do a good job of that, Tim. Uh, you know, we think of the brain as something that evolved sort of continuously over time that, you know, from simpler brains, more complex brains. But one factoid in the book that I didn't know about was that uh, brains appeared and then apparently disappeared in our evolutionary history. Uh, explain that one. Yeah, well, you know, so, so brains are really designed for the complexity of moving in real time through the environment. Plants don't have brains, but even the smallest insects do. Because if you have to make decisions in real time, you need some kind of decision-making ability. And um, so, but there are certain times uh, that certain creatures used to have a brain, but because it takes so much energy to maintain one, they kind of devolved away. There are certain marine animals, sponges and such, that actually there's evidence that they had brains and then became brainless. Because right, it became more, more plant-like basically because they yeah. didn't, uh, didn't have a lot of decisions to make. Yeah, and it's, it's an energy balance. You can think of it for people that we have three major systems in our body. You know, we have digestion, which takes a lot of energy, voluntary motion, you know, moving our bodies voluntarily, and the brain. And the brain in people is super energy intensive. It takes about 25% of our resting calories to power our brain. And that's about three times as much as even our closest great ape, great ape cousins. So it better be doing something useful if it's burning 25% of your energy. Right. And yeah, and one of uh, Kahneman's insights, which uh, I know you are very familiar with, was system one and system two thinking, where system one uh, is a lot easier for our brains to handle. It doesn't uh, involve that uh, uh, grinding away calculation that, uh, you know, uh, making logical, rational analyses and uh, weighing pluses and minuses and doing that. Uh, that's why we like to make emotional decisions, quick decisions, rule-based decisions, uh, things that are pretty energy efficient. You know, we don't uh, yep. you would go to the supermarket, you'd be frozen forever if you tried to make every decision in system two. Uh, well, I'll, I'll go even for just further. one or two so, items. Yeah, I'll go even further. I'll say that if there is there's indisputable evidence that we literally can't decide without an emotional component. In other words, the, the, if you want to call it the logical part of the brain will present us with options, but which one to pick, we're paralyzed. And when you actually damage those parts of the brain that connect the two, people can't decide, literally. So there's no such thing as an unemotional decision. That's mm -hmm. total bullshit. Right. Well, I had uh, Antonio Damasio on the show a while back, and uh, he makes a key point that uh, emotions are not a bug. They are a feature that, you know, they actually serve us very well, even though uh, we always uh, sort of imply that uh, emotional decisions are bad and probably incorrect, uh, that emotions get in the way of, uh, you know, progress and rational thinking and so on. Uh, but in fact, uh, they are really an important, very important part of our thinking process, and they're, yeah. they're there for a reason. Absolutely. And the, and the quote-unquote logical part of the brain is also not there to solve math problems. It's not what's 7 times 14, okay? That part of the brain can function. It's very difficult for it to do so. But as soon as you're not doing some kind of computational task like that, 
it defaults to social reasoning. That's the other thing people misunderstand. The reason our big brain got so big is to figure out the relationships in our tribe, in our group. And we, we have, we're the most social of all mammals, about 100 to 200 close relationships that we can have. So we're modeling things like, oh, Roger, you know, if I went, uh, if my son goes out with your daughter um, and then you hire him as an intern, what kind of fallout will that be on our relationship? I mean, the, the main part of the brain, the modern part, is there to model the complexity and updating those social standing in our tribe. Uh, it's a modeling other people's behavior, and that allows us to cooperate better. Mm -hmm. uh, which brings us to uh, today when, you know, <laughs> we were both talking about going to conferences where we would uh, interact with people, meet people, meet people in our industry, meet people, you know, old friends, new friends, uh, you know, uh, find uh, exciting, interesting people. Like uh, I discovered BJ Fogg at that and said, wow, uh, you know, this guy's really got some great ideas. Uh, yeah, now BJ's everything amazing. is virtual. Uh, you know, what... Uh, uh, and hopefully it won't stay that way for too long. But I'm curious, uh, the book was uh, largely created pre-pandemic. Uh, you know, what have you observed about human behavior since then? And, uh, you know, mm -hmm. what, what advice do you have? Great question. So actually, the book was created during the pandemic. And it was because all of my keynote speaking opportunities uh, fell apart for the foreseeable future that I had the time to focus on writing it. So I actually wrote it this spring during the pandemic. Um, but to, to answer your question, yeah, the, like I said, we have a high need to be social. I have a whole part of the book, several chapters called Hyper Social. Uh, the worst thing you can do to human beings, mammals in general, but us to even a greater degree, is isolate us. And so what you're seeing right now is this cri mental health crisis, domestic abuse is up, suicide is up, um, depression among young people, 18 to 24, a quarter of those people right now are depressed clinically. I mean, so these are things that happen when you isolate people. Uh, and it's very hard. I mean, whatever you think of the politics of gathering in large groups at the moment, it's, it goes against our nature to not do that um, and to get that, that social support. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, people seem to be shocked that college students are returning to campus and actually socializing, partying. you know, going out to parties and <laughs> such. It's like, who could have possibly predicted yeah. that, you know? Thank you, Captain Obvious. Yeah, I mean, yeah. of course. <laughs> but I mean, I, I really think that uh, some people, you know, getting back to sort of your key theme here, uh, there were university administrators who felt that if they simply presented the facts uh, about uh, transmission and infection and risks and so on, uh, that uh, they could then expect students to behave in the way they wanted them to. And of course, that really sort of, you know, I, lots of voices said, no, that's never going to happen. And those voices happen to be right. But uh, it's, I think that's sort of perhaps a metaphor for the bigger picture where we expect that in general, people will behave logically, uh, particularly if we give them the facts, whether it's deciding on a political candidate or a party or uh, deciding mm. what uh, yeah. what brand to buy at the store, you know, when in fact, it really isn't the way it works. No, no. And people uh, don't behave logically or even in their own best interests, I would say. So one of the keys is that understanding that um, our big evolutionary advantage was not adapting to each ecological niche we're in because we took over the whole planet. It was one big bet on spreading culture. And in order to spread culture efficiently, a lot of things have to happen. And one of the keys is that we need to basically mimic and ape and transmit information to our tribe unaltered. In other words, if I just tell you something, whether it's right, wrong, or indifferent, you have to copy it faithfully to pass it on to the next person. If you don't do that, then the tribe doesn't have cohesion and our group advantage of surviving based on our cultural knowledge goes away. And so what that means is that, especially in times of uncertainty, people fall back on their learned cultural patterns, on their tribal knowledge, instead of believing what their own eyes and direct experience actually tell them. So that's, again, not a, a bug. It's a feature of human beings. We evolve for culture spread, and being faithful to our tribal culture is what we do in times of uncertainty. Right. I guess uh, that leads into the power of story that you mentioned in your book, because uh, that's one key way uh, culture and information is transmitted in a relatively faithful fashion. You know, you don't uh, give people a list of five things to remember. If you incorporate 
that as part of a compelling story, people will remember it. Absolutely. So I have a whole chapter on storytelling. There's just so much in the book. I'm sorry, I'm jumping around a little that's bit. That's good. No, that's um, we're trying to. You know, we know we've got a limited time here, Tim. Uh, we, let's communicate as much <laughs> as we can. Uh, uh, some valuable information yeah. for our audience. And uh, absolutely, uh, maybe we so putting this all in the form of stories, perhaps uh, <laughs> make it more memorable. I, I wish we could, but uh, yeah, not enough <laughs> next time. Next time. But but one of the stories I want to tell you is that there's two reasons for stories to exist if you think about it. So one of them is to spread cultural knowledge. And again, that's critical, um, that stories reinforce values, belief systems. For example, if I were to tell you the story of the matador who you know, deftly sidesteps and sticks his sword between the shoulder blades of the bull in the arena, you know, if I'm telling that story to someone that's in Spain, they're thinking, oh, you know, the impeccable warrior, the tradition, the culture, all of this personal bravery stuff. And if I tell that to someone who's uh, you know, PETA and the ethical treatment of animals, they'll think, okay, that's barbaric and we're subsidizing the torture of, of animals, right? So the same story, the same objective truth is experienced through very different prisms depending on our background cultural package and what we bring to it. So one main function of stories is to enforce tribal cohesion and, and to make sure that there's fidelity to how we behave inside of our own tribe. Okay. The other important function of story is to simulate reality. So if you go to the movies and you see someone taking a leap off of a cliff and then they survive the fall and dive into the lake, well, you don't wanna try that too many times. The first time you try it, you might die, but vicariously experience something in the form of a story allows you to essentially get secondhand experience. So the other function of story is simulation. So we can try dangerous stuff or try situations that we're not likely to encounter and kind of get training for life but without having to pay the price. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I I think it's uh, one story was one of my first sort of neuromarketing uh, uh, things because there was this great research that showed that you could just about control somebody's brain with a story. I think I used that in my you talk can. at your early conversion conference where yes, uh, they put uh, subjects in two different fMRI machines and found that when one person started telling a story. Uh, the other person's brain synchronized with it literally in just a matter of seconds. That's right. That's right. Uh, and again, and it's important to have the same cultural background. Otherwise, you're going to interpret things very differently. But you can literally get areas of the brain to sync up at the meaning level, not the words or sounds. It can mm -hmm. be translated to a different language. But the meaning that they take away from it is the same, assuming they're part of the same cultural tribe. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Tim, do you have any surprises when you were researching the book? I mean, you've obviously been working in the space and a lot of this was sort of just sort of uh, recording what you already knew and maybe uh, sort of documenting it to make sure you had it, had it right. But uh, uh, as you, you're doing the research, do you find anything that said, well, hey, I didn't know that. That's really interesting. Oh, God, there's so many nuggets in the book. I can't even um, start to list them. But one of the things on a personal level that was very powerful was how important sleep is you know a lot of people talk about well you know diet exercise and sleep and sleep's like a distant third no sleep is the prerequisite for all life it's daily life support there's no animal on the planet insect or animal that doesn't have some form of sleep and there's a lot of detailed nuances to that but basically if you're not getting seven to nine hours of sleep on a regular basis you're literally killing yourself in fact i just saw an article um yesterday that said those uh, amyloid proteins that build up in the brain of Alzheimer's patients, that happens when you don't have regular sleep. So if you want to get Alzheimer's earlier, don't sleep, okay? Yeah, uh, that, so sleep is just so critical. You know, that's, that's the bottom line. Yeah, everything uh, f coming out from research in the last few years has emphasized that, uh, but uh, you know, not everybody has quite internalized that, but I, I have personally <laughs> been working on my own sleep habits uh, because I had a years ago, been of the school that, well, hey, if I can save an hour, less, hour a day by sleeping less, you know, that's time saved. But uh, uh, then the research, yeah. research started coming no, out no. and saying, okay, yeah. that's, that's not really the right way to do it. Yeah, well, what happens is you get more paranoid because you can't judge people's um, emotional affect accurately. You get less creative. You can't memorize information and you forget all the physical training. If you're training physical skills that you learn the day before, if you don't get adequate sleep, you can't cheat sleep. 
Mm -hmm. what, what habits have you changed? Have you worked on your sleep or are there some other habits that you've changed uh, or behaviors that you've changed uh, as you research the book and say, wow, hey, this is something I need to do? Yeah, you know, I've been much more conscious of culture spread. So again, there's lots of things that need to happen for culture to happen. And one of those is you have to be willing to learn. And I consider myself a lifelong learner. But again, if you're going to have that chain of information spread and transmission, you have to be equally willing to teach. And so the payoff of mentoring and the prestige that we get from that is something that I'm keenly aware of, paying it forward of teaching others to create that transmission. I think that's a huge motivator for people, um, often more than even money or overt success, is the prestige of mentoring others. Uh, so that's something I'm keenly aware of and I try to actively do. And actually my book, this book is one of my attempts to do that. Yeah, well, there was some uh, research a while back that I saw on uh, sort of the human need for mentoring, to be a mentor, that uh, yes. uh, it, it, as you reach a certain stage in your life, uh, there is almost an evolutionary compulsion uh, to be a mentor, to teach yeah. people stuff. It's not uh, almost. It's, it's, it's absolutely compulsion. Think about this. We're the only mammal that lives decades beyond our reproductive years. That's so we can transmit culture and knowledge. We, most animals, you don't reproduce, die. You're useless, right? We actually are there to teach the younger ones. Mm-hmm. Right. I'm, I think that uh, valuing the wisdom of elders is increasingly uh, important to me as uh, I get as we get to elder. be elders. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Uh, yeah. But uh, anyway, I, I want to be respectful of your time. Uh, I'll tell our listeners and viewers uh, how they can find you and your ideas. Absolutely. Well, that's easy enough. Um, I, if you want to know about my public speaking or internet consulting, I still do quite a bit of that. Uh, just go to timash.com. And all the information about the book, again, um, it's available in ebook, audio book, and you get autographed copies of me right, from me right now, pre-release in the U.S., uh, is available at primalbrain.com. So just timash.com and primalbrain.com, and you'll get all the info you need. Great. Well, we will link to those places and to any other resources we spoke about on the show notes page at rogerdooley.com slash podcast. And we'll have the audio, video, and text versions of our conversation there too. Tim, thanks for being on the show. Good to catch up. Oh, Roger, it, it's always a pleasure. I wish we had more time. <laughs>